Closer to home, the Australian Federal Police has launched a second investigation into the Optus data breach. Named Operation Guardian, the investigation aims to identify and protect 10,000 customers whose details were leaked online. All up 9 million Australians had their personal information hacked, including passport and Medicare numbers. Joining me now is former Howard Government Minister Peter McGoran, of course, now with Bondi Partners. And Peter, this, this Optus breach is a, is a wake-up call for corporate Australia and the Australian government. Oh, absolutely, Tim. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible threatening to the individuals and makes the rest of us wonder, well, how vulnerable are we? Look, you, you do have to give your identity when you're opening accounts, um, and often they require two, a uh, driver's licence and a passport because people can fake documents. But how safe is it? Uh, but for the grace of God, there go a lot of companies... It's the biggest wake-up call. And by the way, you didn't need a wake-up call, Tim. This has been around for years. Many companies would say, we've been investing heavily. It's, it's all a question, I understand, of how much you're willing to spend to protect yourself against uh, for, for cyber security. Yeah, and governments have uh, got a lot of this in their lap, don't they? Like uh, Apps like uh, MyGov and, and other things can help. Yep. The, the, the government has the resources to protect their data to a far greater extent. I'm not saying it's guaranteed, Tim, but they have absolute specialists and there's rather a low-key, shall we say, secretive organisation within government that also deals with military and defence and national security issues. And they are called upon to help protect social security, health and so on. Yeah, and that may be an opportunity. Obviously, everyone's looking at this and how people can track their credit records. Now, what about uh, the Federal Corruption Commission? Is it important Peter Dutton gets on board? Oh, look, very much, Tim, because it's a legacy issue for him uh, in that the Morrison government committed to it, couldn't agree within their own ranks, uh, so he wants it off the table, and he also believes in it, uh, but he also has to get the balance right because there's a lot of Liberals who regard the idea of an independent corruption and inscription as abhorrent. It's because everybody's innocent till proven guilty. Often that commission will turn that on its head. So he doesn't want an internal um, philosophical debate. So I think he's threaded the needle on this. And the big question, Tim, to me is, where does that leave the teals? Because let's face it, the teals had two big issues. Mm. A corruption commission introduction, well, it's about to go through the parliament, not exactly as they want, but not far off it. And the second was climate change, particularly uh, a legislated increase of the reduction of, of, of uh, emissions before 2030. That's gone, already gone through the parliament. So it's going to be interesting to see how they find themselves a new relevance. And, and you need the major parties to have the same lens on, on some things like this for, for the future viability. Tim, you've hit the nail on the head. This just shows that when the two major parties work together, the crossbenchers and the teals, let alone the Greens, mm. become irrelevant. But there's not a great many issues where the two major parties could work together, except on economics. And let's face it, the economy, when the budget comes down during October, is, is going to dwarf all other issues. And if there's cooperation between the two sides of Parliament, then the, the, the sideline antics and bids... Uh, by the smaller parties will be rendered irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the final budget outcomes from last year was a, a bit better, but there's still some huge challenges for Jim Chalmers. Uh, absolutely. Uh, he, seems, he seems to be well on top of it at the moment. Particularly he, when you see the UK. Particularly when you see look at what, yeah. what happened at the UK, where the government decided to roll the dice mm. uh, and, and announce huge tax increases of the kind everybody would welcome. But is it fantasy land? Well, the markets and, and uh, seem to suggest that it is fantasy land. They're in a, a lot of trouble. It, it all depends whether or not the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer were right in the first place. If they're wrong, as most people are beginning to believe, then the UK is going to go straight into recession. History would say that leadership needs to be extra strong against maniacal leaders. We've seen these pictures come out of Russia this morning, the four annexed uh, regions of Ukraine, everyone saying that it's, it's the largest escalation of the war that's been going since February. How important is it for the leadership of the UN and the rest of the world to stay strong? Because he obviously wants everyone to be terrified by what some would call sabre-rattling with the, with the nuclear word. I agree with that. 
uh, the world has to stay strong and united, and it is. Um, I'm one of those who believe that Western Europe was so decayed politically and socially that they could not ever was ever unite to to draw a line in the stand against a dictator like uh, Xi or uh, Putin. But they have, and the Americans won't waver in the slightest. Putin has lost the war. He's lost it. He now has to try to reclaim it somehow or find an exit ramp of which he's showing no interest in. So it is a very uncertain period. The Americans were telling me six to eight weeks ago that he was losing uh, and they were beginning to plan for the uh, scenarios of how he might react. So none of what he's doing now will be a total surprise to the Americans and therefore uh, NATO. Uh, but ha how you control him is another thing. He's not weak domestically. He still has all the arms of the bureaucracy, the military, the business establishment, the media and so on. Mm. So it is a very unpredictable and dangerous period we're moving into. But militarily, he's in deep trouble. Yeah, and, and all the clapping and cheering and uh, is, is obvious because if you don't clap and cheer, you get arrested. It's as simple as that in Russia. It's as simple as that. Now, let's move to a brighter subject back here. Of course, Pete, you and I both have a, a passion for horse racing. We've got racing dreams coming on at 9 o'clock. You are the chairman of the Australian Turf Club. And it's a mighty, mighty day at Royal Randwick today with three Group 1s, the Epsom... The Metro, the flight, and then we've got the Premier, which, of course, is the last time we'll see a few of these Everest yeah. contenders. It's a tsunami of great racing. Absolutely. Team. Beautiful horses, magnificent animals, prepared and trained to the minute, uh, brave, courageous and skilled jockeys and very happy owners and enter entertained race goers. It's got something for everybody. You got a small tip for us? You got a tip? Um, just one, one tip. You know, bet with your head, um, not over it, but just something. No. no. Oh, I sorry, Tim. Fence, okay. What will I do? Ice bath? Can ice bath find Of me? course. I knew there was a horse I had bath. to tell you. Ice bath. Ice bath. An absolute certainty. Absolutely. Oh, photos and all sorts of stuff. Would have won four million. Already won four and a half. Good to see you. Thanks, Tim. We'll see you next week. Most certainly. Peter McGoran.